Dear children, today we are going to see the continuation of the lesson applications of biotechnology. The first topic uh, in the second part we are, we are going to see is the molecular diagnostics. Molecular diagnostics. What are all the things that you see here? The molecules, what molecules do you see? The DNA and the structure, everything we are going to see here deeply. What is molecular diagnostics? Let us have a small introduction about that. Okay. Now, molecular diagnostics. Actually, early diagnostics of infectious disease or inherent genetic defects is essential for an appropriate treatment. Right. Early deduction of the disease is not possible using conventional diagnostic methods like microscopic examina uh, examinations, serum analysis and urine analysis. So what do we have to do? Oh, so we should find something better, isn't it? So for that, we go for the laboratory techniques, uh, which is supposed to be an indirect and always specific. So the scientists, they are continuously searching for a specific and sensitive and a simple diagnostic techniques for the diagnostics of the testes, the diseases. So, the techniques. After that, the result of that search has resulted in the techniques that are reliable, which help in the early diagnosis or number one, recombinant DNA technology, polymerase chain reactions, PCR, what we are very much familiar now in the present condition for corona, PCR, PCR, PCR. You would have learned about this everywhere you would have heard PCR technique. So that is the advanced technique we are going to see about that. And then the allies uh, technique, what do you call it as the enzyme, linked, immunosub and assay. So these are the three things which we are going to discuss today mainly. So the presence of pathogens like the virus, bacteria and uh, the microorganisms like this is detected only when the pathogen produces the symptoms in the patient. Okay. By the time the symptoms appear, the concentration of the pathogens become very high in the body. However, a very low concentration of the bacteria or a virus, even when the symptom of the disease does not appear, can be detected by the amplification of their nucleic acid. So we are amplifying it. That means you are trying to multiply the structure, thereby you are able to find out who is the culprit in that. Okay, so that is our agenda. So the first one, ELISA, the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay test. See the lady here, the eminent person discovered by Eva Engwell and Peter Paul Manning in 1971. The ELISA test, which is a very popular test, which we are going on for each and every aspect. It is an attribution to the scientific research. ELISA, what is ELISA? The biochemical procedure to detect the presence of a specific antibodies or antigens in a sample or a urine, whichever it is, the serum or urine. So here, the ELISA is a very important tool to determine, number one, the serum antibody concentrations. You know what is a serum? What is a serum? Actually, it is the content without the corpuscles. Without the corpuscles, we call it as a serum. So here, you'll find the antibodies produced in a person infected by the pathogens such as HIV. And you can conclude that whether a person is having HIV positive or negative. For that, it is very, very useful once upon a time. Now, for detecting the presence of a specific antigen and hormone such as human chorionic gonadotropin, where do you find that? See here from the Korean, we are trying to isolate it. So the hormones are also present here. Now it is advanced techniques uh, which are developed by the scientists now. You should appreciate that. Hats off to them. Now, before entering into the procedure, let us have a knowledge about these two. That is the antibody and antigen. What is antibody? The proteins produced by the immune system which help defend against the antigens. Okay, so they are the proteins. We know that. This is a symbol for that, the antibodies, immunoglobin. Have you seen this in your textbook? This one? This one? Yes. The other one is the antigen. 
that is any molecule that induces the production of antibodies when introduced in the body of an animal is called an antigen any molecule that induces the production of antibodies unless and until you have an opposite reaction there is no chance for the antibody to start its work so for that it needs some sort of induction by the antigen okay so the structure for antigen you will find it here see the symbol here antibodies and antigens you must be aware of these two topics okay only then you can enter into this you need to have a knowledge of antigen and antibody only then you can understand this procedure okay the first one is the elisa technique the first uh, level is nothing but this during diagnosis you start the diagnosis with the sample suspect to contain the antigen immobilized you have to immobilize them on the surface of the elisa plate please take a at a look at uh, a look at the picture which is uh, given as a support here first of all the sample is immobilized and it is placed on the surface of the elisa plate after that the antibody specific to this antigen the antibody which is specific to this antigen is added and allowed to react with the immobilized antigen children listen to this particular word immobilized antigen there the antibody specific is added okay then after that the antibody anti antibody look at the word anti antibody that means the second antibody okay now it is linked to a appropriate enzyme like the peroxidase so we have to include the peroxidase the enzyme is more important see usually the scientists they have to use uh, they'll be using this hard radish peroxidase most commonly used so this is one aspect because they'll be getting some sort of color as a result to discriminate the result for that they are using this particular enzyme anti antibody which is linked to an appropriate enzyme like the peroxidase so the next one after that the fourth step the unreacted antibody that is the second antibody what we call it as anti antibody is all washed away and the substrate of the enzyme have the hydrogen peroxidase is added with a certain reagent such as 4 chloro naphthol see children first we are taking the antigen antibody we are making them uh, immobilized by the the antigen is first of all immobilized after that the antibody is added and then what we have to do we are adding this substrate now second antibody is washed out then we are adding the substrate hydrogen peroxidase and 4 chloro naphthol is added see the reaction side by side you can see the reaction which is given in the picture then finally the activity of the enzyme yields a colored product what do you call it? a purple color is given indicating the presence of antigen now the culprit is found out by the discrimination of the color see the intensity of the color actually the intensity of the color is directly proportional to the amount of antigen which can be qualified by the elisa reader you have the elisa reader so that will be reading the proportion of the antigen and then the intensity is also read out so here we can see the picture the substrate and the enzyme all are getting linked to the primary antibody secondary antibody now you are getting the color here so we are able to identify this so the positive negative and the assay result for the patient is given here like this the result is given so elisa hats of elisa so highly sensitive and can detect antigens at the range of even a nanogram level we call it as a nanogram level, less than the dust particle isn't it so that nanogram level can be viewed that can be uh, analyzed here now there are four kinds of elisa four kinds of elisa one is uh, the direct elisa indirect elisa sandwich elisa and competitive elisa see the picture for the support which is given here for the direct indirect sandwich and competitive elisa so whatever happens you can have uh, for what it is used so i have given here so in case if the indirect one if it is uh, the direct one which is given for uh, for the indirect it is for to detect the antibody hiv and uh, the sandwich to detect the antigen which are present on the tumors uh, and the competitive one for free testosterone uh, analysis so like that there are uh, divisions to use this type of uh, elisa so the results also given like this so just for uh, 
indication. I've given this. See this ELISA performing test to the kit. You can see the kit here, the ELISA reader, the components, the pre-coated stabilized 96 well micro cytoplate. So there only you have to immobilize the antigen. Okay, the sample dilute and all these are the kits which are used in the ELISA. Okay, this is the ELISA plate. And even I have uh, added a picture showing a prominent uh, antibody antigen reaction, giving colors. See the last fourth diagram, you can see the purple color which is added here. After the complete procedure is over, the result, very easily they can find out with the help of ELISA, the problem of the disease can be analyzed. So what are the salient features of the ELISA? It is highly sensitive and specific method for diagnosis. Highly sensitive and specific method. About uh, advantage, as far as advantage is concerned, not requiring radio isotopes or radiation counting apparatus. See, there is no need of radio isotopes. It is not requiring any radio isotopes, no side effects. And radiation counting apparatus is also not necessary as far as this case is concerned. Fine. The next one is the PCR, polymerase chain reaction. You might have heard about this word. Now for the present corona problem, we are undergoing a test uh, with the help of the PCR kit. You might have heard about that. The government is announcing uh, the PCR kit is ready. You can go for the analysis of your uh, problem, whether you have positive or negative uh, test. If you have corona in your body, no. We can take this as a chance. But earlier, adding to this, we should add a knowledge about polymerase chain reaction. That is, what is polymerase chain reaction? What is polymerase chain reaction? Actually, this is an in vitro amplification technique used for the synthesis of multiple identical copies of DNA, which is of interest. You see, it is an in vitro amplification technique. I told you already, multiplying, taking as many copies. You can synthesize multiple identical copies of the DNA, which is of interest. Okay, discovered by Carrie Banks Mullers, 1983. So they are, these are the kits which we are going to use here for the PCR. You can see this added things, sample, tag polymerase, primers, all these things will be involved in, the, in this particular procedure. Next one, what are the steps involved in this? That is number one, denaturation. Number two, renaturation or primer annealing. And the third one, synthesis or primer extension. Now, the double-stranded DNA of the interest is first of all denatured. So, it was denatured first of all. Okay, to separate the two individuals of the strands by high temperature. So, this you call it as denaturation. And the second step, here each strand, see after denaturation, each strand is allowed to hybridize with the primer, that is renaturation or primer annealing. First of all, you are denaturing it. After that, you are renaturing it with the help of the hybridized primer. And now the primer template is used to synthesize DNA by using tag DNA polymerase, that is the Thermus aquaticus. That is used as a tag DNA polymerase here. And after that, uh, see, one thing you have to keep in mind, denaturation is possible only if the reaction mixture is heated to 95 degree centigrade for the short time to denature the target DNA into a, a single strand that will act as a template for DNA synthesis. So after that, the third one, annealing is done. Annealing. What is annealing? By, uh, that is you are adding both of them, isn't it? You have separated and then you are giving a hybridization with the primer and then now you are annealing it by a rapid cooling. So how can it be done by rapid cooling of the mixture allowing the primers to bind to the sequence each of them the two strands flanking the target DNA. So after that the see here during primer extension or uh, synthesis the temperature should be 75 degree centigrade. Earlier we, we need the temperature as a 95 degree centigrade to separate. Now for annealing, after annealing, primer extension or synthesis, the degree of the temperature should be 75 degree. That is sufficient for the time to allow the tag DNA polymerase to extend 
the primer by copying the single stranded template. So now you can see this picture. So this is Thermus aquaticus. Actually, this is identified for, to use as a polymerase, DNA polymerase for the uh, annealing work or uh, for this PCR, we are using this tag DNA polymerase. Okay. At the end of incubation, so after the incubation, both the single template strands will be made partially double standard. You are making it partially double standard. Please use the picture for support to identify this topic relevant to the picture which is given there. The new strands, now we have the new strands of each double DNA strand uh, of DNA extends to a variable distance. Uh, distance downstream, see here. It is extending to the variable distance. After that, uh, these steps are repeated again and again. So, how many number of copies would you like to have? You can have the desired DNA and by extending it again and again. So, this process is called as DNA amplification. This is also given in your textbook in figure number 9.8. You can have a verification of this particular picture for this topic. Okay. So, the PCR technique and also be used for the amplification of RNA also. Okay, not only for DNA, for the amplification of RNA also this technique can be applied. So, by using the reverse transcription PCR, that is RT-PCR, see the picture there which is given for support. Here, the RNA molecules, mRNA, mainly messenger RNA must be converted to a complementary DNA, what do you call it as cDNA by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. So, this serves as a template for the PCR. Fine, very good. See here, for the PCR, we need some enzymes, isn't it? So, the enzymes uh, for cutting, you need restriction enzymes. For adding, see ligation, ligases. Again, for uh, the hybridization technique for that, you need the polymerases. Very simple, isn't it? Scientists, science has developed a lot. Children, you can very easily observe this picture. You can understand the entire PCR polymerase chain reaction by having a look at this. Okay, just I have given this for you to understand very easily. Thank you. Next one, PCR in clinical diagnosis. Let's go for clinical diagnosis. Okay, why should we use PCR? What is the clinical diagnosis? Where can we use this? It is mainly understood only for the specificity and sensitivity by identifying the particular disease causing pathogen. Okay, now based on the diagnosis of the infection, the disease, it may be very simple like the pathogen. If it is present in the clinical specimen, well and good, the DNA will be present in that. It is understood. Now, the unique sequence can be detected. How can you detect with the help of the specimen? Where do you find the specimen? In the blood, in the blood, in the stool, the spinal fluid or in the sputum. This is what you call it as the PCR mixture. Okay, then the PCR. So, how far you can employ this? By this can be employed even for the prenatal diagnosis, prenatal diagnosis before the birth of the child. So, birth of the baby. You can identify certain inherited disease by using the chorionic villi samples or cells from amniocentesis. Also, the diseases like sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, phenylcutinuria, all this can be detected by the PCR. See this sickle cell anemia, the child having the problem, and this one, thalassemia, and also the phenylcutinuria children, how they are affected. Whether they are adult or not, you see the children, they are getting affected by this. Okay, all this can be identified with the help of PCR clinical diagnosis. The PCR is a valuable tool for monitoring the retroviral infections. Even uh, the preliminary stages, they might be having the tuberculosis caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, what do you call it as TB. That, even that is identified by the PCR. Okay, the prenatal diagnosis, when I say this, the amniocentesis, I have already told you about this amniocentesis, chorionic villi sample. See from here, the chorion, from the chorion, they can uh, uh, ooze out a certain, uh, they can uh, take out some amount of the fluid. There, the cells will be shed in the amniotic fluid. That can also be uh, sent for diagnosis. So, PCR, uh, it is also very much useful in a TB analysis whether they are affected by mycobacterium, tuberculosis, see the bones structure, they are getting very thin, isn't it, due to the HIV. This is also one of the symptoms. 
So this is used to get uh, an awareness, used to detect the sex linked in disorders right from the fertilized embryos. See, you can identify these sex linked disorders when it is in the embryo stage itself. See here, when the X chromosome, it is comparatively very larger than the Y chromosome. So this is also a problematic one. All these can be analyzed with the help of PCR technique. Okay, the sex of the human beings and the livestock of the embryos in vitro can be determined by the PCR using the primers and DNA probes. The primers and DNA probes actually they are like the train uh, tracks. They can very easily identify these uh, anomalies which are present in the sex of human beings when it is in the embryo stage itself. See the comparison. I have given a picture for you to compare this. Okay. So the applications of PCR, applications, what is the application, how, where can we use, okay, all these points we have find out. The differences in the genomes, that is the entire set of chromosomes of two different organisms can be studied, that is number one, fine. Next, the study of evolutions of more specifically phylogenetics, okay, evolution, phylogeny. And then you can amplify even minute quantities of DNA from any source like the hair or the mummified tissues, bones or any fossilized materials used in the field of forensic medicine. Here forensic medicine we have to find out the criminals who have done this criminal activity. So many things we are watching in TV every day, so many problems. A single molecule of DNA from the blood stain, hair, semen of an individual is amplified DNA to develop the DNA fingerprinting. So this is useful for identification of the criminals, whoever has done this work. And so the amplification of a specific DNA segment is also used in the gene therapy. Okay, gene therapy means manipulation of the, manipulation of the gene segment, whichever is defective. Now, the next topic which we are going to see is the transgenism. Transgenism, so a change in the genome a selective breeding methods were carried out to improve the genetic characteristics of a livestock or an animal. So it may be a domestic animal. Modern biotechnology actually it is possible to carry some manipulations okay uh, like at the genetic level to get the desired traits. Whatever we desire we can carry out at the level of genes. So the transgenesis, what is transgenesis? It's a process of introduction of extra DNA into the genome. It may be a foreign or an exogenous material of the animal to create and maintain stable heritable characters. Stable heritable characters. Our agenda is it must be stable and should be heritable. Now the foreign DNA that is introduced is called the transgene and the animals that produced that are produced by the DNA manipulations are called transgenic animals. So the foreign DNA is called transgene and the animals that are produced by DNA manipulation are called as transgenic animals or the genetically engineered or genetically modified organisms GMO. Okay. Now the next one you can see the picture here the crystal jellyfish with the GFP. See like a laser. Wherever the animal goes, we can find out where is that lab mouse when it is introduced into this, the fluorescent pigment is introduced here. So this is one technique they have adopted in the lab. Okay. Just for an uh, example, I have given that. The steps involved in the production of transgenic organisms. Okay. How to do this? First of all, you have to identify and separate the desired gene. The second step, you have to select a vector. What is a vector? What is a vector? You have to carry the material. It may be a virus for direct transmission. Next one is combining the desired gene with the vector introduction of transferred vector into the cells, tissues, embryos or mature individual. Finally, you are demonstrating the integration of expression of a foreign gene in the transgenic tissue or animals. So the first step, identification and separation of the desired gene, selection of a vector, then you are combining with the desired gene into the vector, 
introduction of the transport vector into the target cells, tissues or the embryo or the matured individual, then you are demonstrating the integration of the expression of a foreign gene in the transgenic tissues. Where can you find this? Which are all the animals you can use? Here, the mice, rat, rabbit, pig, cow, goat, sheep, fish, anything can be used for this purpose. Find uses of transgenesis to study the expression and development of processes in higher organisms helps in the improvement of the genetic characters in the animals. Transgenic animals serve as a good model for understanding the human disease and help in the investigation of new treatments for the disease. See, for our purpose, each and everything is used only for the, only for the benefit of human beings. Transgenic models, transgenic models, they exist for many human diseases such as cancer, Alzheimer disease, cystic fibrosis, rheumatoid, arthritis, sickle cell anemia. For all these, the research work is carried out with this transgenic organisms. Okay, transgenic animals. Another one, the transgenic mice, which is used for testing safety of the vaccines. First of all, see once when the scientist has completed his research work, it has to be applied to some animals. So that animal uh, lab rat is used. So that may be a transgenic mice. Before that, before the application to the humans, it has to be tested for safety. So in that case, the vaccines are also tested with the help of transgenic mice. The transgenic animals which are used for testing toxicity, mainly the toxicity, in the animals that carry the genes which make them sensitive to the toxic substance, poisonous substance, isn't it? Maybe toxic. And those non transgenic animals, they are exposed to toxic substance, and we are we can study the effects thereafter. So the transgenesis is important for improving the quality and quantity of the milk, meat, eggs, wood, and the wool production. Okay in addition to testing the drug resistance. Not only for the drugs, but also for our own purpose, domestic purposes, like the milk, meat, eggs, and the oil production. Okay, for all this, we are using the transgenesis process. Okay, the next topic, biological products and their uses. Biological products is a substance derived from a living organism used for the prevention or treatment of a disease the list of biological products, antitoxins, bacterial or viral vaccines, blood products and hormones, hormone extracts are said to be the biological products. Through recombinant DNA technology, our DNA, it is possible to produce these biological products on demand. Okay. So, only on demand we can produce with the help of biological products. So, many types are there which are approved are therapeutic proteins, monoclonal antibodies and vaccines. So, the healthcare pharmaceuticals, you might have heard about this healthcare and pharmaceutical industries. Now, in Amazon, you are getting so many products. It has been revolutionized only by the biotechnological proteins, hormones, antibodies. They are commercially used in the medical industries and uh, the recombinant hormones such as the human insulin, human growth hormone, recombinant vaccines and recombinant proteins like human alpha lactalbumin. All these are the recombinant hormones produced by the biotechnology. Okay, advanced revolution. Revolution, you can say, in the biotechnology. So, the animals which are used as bioreactors, they produce the desirable proteins which is necessary for us. And antibodies, they are nothing but the substance which reacts against the disease causing antigens. That can also be produced by the transgenic animals as the bioreactors. And monoclonal antibodies, which is mainly used to treat the cancer, heart disease, and transplant rejection. And natural protein adhesives, what do you call it, natural, natural protein adhesives, the non-toxic biodegrader, which rarely trigger an immune response. Very rarely they trigger the immune response, which are used to reattach the tendons. Those uh, who underwent a um, uh, very uh, serious accident, the tendons might have got uh, cut due to that. They might be get amputated. Not necessary. We have the natural proteins here to reattach the tendons connecting the bones okay, and the tissues. They fill cavities in the teeth and the repair of the broken bones. For all this, natural protein adhesives are used. Okay, fine. The next topic which you are going to see here is the cloning. Cloning. Have you heard of this word cloning? 
cloning animal cloning is the process of producing genetical identically genetically identical individual of an organism either naturally or artificially so earlier in nature by nature itself the asexual reproduction through asexual reproduction clones are produced you know about that whereas in biotechnology the cloning refers to the process of creating copies of organisms or copies of cells or dna fragments that is nothing but the molecular cloning then dolly have you seen dolly see here dolly this was the first mammal that is a sheep the transgenic clone developed by the nuclear transfer technique that is here the phenomenon that is used here is totipotency discovered by ian wilmer and camphor in 1997 dolly see how beautiful it is isn't it totipotency what do you mean by totipotency the ability of the cell to produce the complete organism which may be able to develop it has shows the potential in the different cells like the tissues organs and finally develop into a organism totipotency so here the mammary gland adult cell from one side the adult cell somatic cell is uh, from a donor sheep or were isolated and this is subject to, to starvation starvation means it doesn't do any other work no more uh, cleaving or any other work nothing is done it is allowed uh, for starvation for 5 days after this cells could not undergo normal growth cycle and they enter into a dormant stage so that is why starvation is given they enter into a dormant stage and they become totipotent okay see the supporting picture for that and then after that another one an ovum from the egg cell was taken so from the other sheep an ovum from the egg cell was taken and the nucleus was removed to form an e nucleated form see here it is e nucleated the nucleus was taken out the dormant mammary gland cell or the adult cell and the e nucleated cell of the ovum they both were fused okay now the outer membrane of the mammary cell was ruptured what happened after the fusion the outer membrane of the mammary cell was ruptured and allowing the ovum to envelop into the nucleus so the ovum now this ovum gets envelops it envelops the nucleus taking the dominance over that see the fused cell was implanted after that into the e which served as a surrogate mother surrogate mother after 5 months later dolly was born so what we are concluding the first animal to be cloned from a differentiated somatic cell taken from the adult animal without the process of fertilization and hats off to ian wilmot with his product dolly the sheep so what are the advantages clinical traits and medical research beneficial production of proteins and drugs in the field of medicine aids in stem cell research save endangered species that is the main agenda you have to space uh, you have to give a space for the endangered species to get saved and another one disadvantages is nothing but according to the animal and the human activities the view is uh they say it is a threat to the biodiversity might alter the evolution producing an impact on the population and the ecosystem so this process is said to be very tedious and expensive and can and can cause animals to suffer to get one organism you have to destroy as many number of ovum or the cells so that is why the animals will be suffering whereabout the animal surrogates they were manifesting adverse outcomes like the cloned animals if they were affected with the disease they have high mortality rate that means the death rate so to compromise this human health through consumption of the cloned animal meat so they might have a health hazard by eating this animal meat and the cloned animals age faster than the normal animals and are less healthy than the parent organism and can lead to the occurrence of genetic disorders in the animals more than 90% of the cleaning attempts fail to produce a viable offspring so finally we are coming to the end of this lesson the ethical issues with the advanced biotechnology ethical issues we are very scared about this sometimes this may be uh, acceptable certain things may be acceptable and certain things we don't accept so in that way biotechnology has given to the society a cheap drugs better fruits vegetables pest resistant crops indigenous cure to the disease and a lot of controversies also 
prevailing. Now, since a major part of the modern uh, biotechnology deals with the genetic ma manipulations, people fear that it may lead to the unknown consequences. What is that unknown consequence? The major apprehension of the recombinant DNA technology is that unique microorganisms either inadvertently or deliberately for the purpose of war may be developed that could cause epidemics or environmental catastrophes. For that, people are scared about biotechnology. On the other hand, risk factors of genetic engineering are slight and the potential benefits are substantial. So, children, I'm coming to the last part and thank you so much for viewing this particular video. Hope this would have given an enrichment for you. Thank you so much.